Hi, it's Mr. Ramage, and this video lesson is going to take a quick look at the Second Industrial Revolution, which takes place around the year 1870 to about 1914. This is where the Industrial Revolution that we've previously talked about sort of shifts gears and transforms into this sort of second revolution of inventions and products. Now, this isn't going to be a very deep dive, but we are going to cover some major topics. Uh, so the first industrial revolution that we've previously been studying was developed around the production of textiles. So it was textile machines and then mills and factories, which really ramped up our industrial revolution in England. Also, iron and coal and railroads were kind of the foundation of that first industrial revolution. As we get closer to the 1900s and the 20th century, we're going to begin to see a shift away from these products and into some new um, products and inventions. So the second industrial revolution will now begin to focus on steel rather than iron, oil, gasoline, and electricity rather than coal and steam power. So in terms of steel, uh, the guy that's probably the most famous person in terms of steel production in uh, the United States and the rest of the world is Henry Bessemer. So Bessemer in 1855 develops a new process for uh, producing steel. Steel has obviously been around, but again, like most other things that we've seen, the process was slow, it was expensive, it was inefficient. His Bessemer process will produce a better quality steel at a much, much, much lower cost. So once he implements this, pro uh, this process, the cost of refining steel goes from $80 a ton to $9 a ton, which is a incredible reduction in the cost of the manufacture of steel. So now steel becomes much more affordable. It's a better product. It's lighter than iron. It's stronger than iron. And steel now replaces iron as the major building block moving forward in this second phase of the Industrial Revolution. And we're going to see steel become a major industry because we're going to use it for everything. We are going to be able to grow bigger and uh, faster and cheaper as we construct wider bridges, longer bridges, stronger bridges, taller buildings, bigger buildings. So steel allows us to build uh, wider structures that are strong and can hold up uh, taller structures. So buildings begin to get taller. Uh, we're going to use it on our steamboats to make them bigger. We're going to use it on our railroads. Uh, steel becomes the, of course, major, major, major building material of the second industrial revolution moving forward. Cities like Cleveland and Pittsburgh uh, are going to become steel cities whose main uh, business will be the manufacture of steel. Uh, so steel becomes the new king of building materials. In Europe in 1860, England, France, uh, Germany, and Belgium were producing 125,000 tons of steel in 1860 after the implementation of the Bessemer process. And by the start of World War I in 1914, these countries alone are producing 32 million tons of steel. So we can see a huge jump uh, in the course of about 50 years from 125,000 tons to 32 million tons. Um, so steel is being produced in a large, large, large scale. So steel replaces iron as the primary source of building materials. Now we're going to begin to replace our power source. So the steam engine was our power source for pretty much everything. But as we get into the late 1800s, electricity is going to take over. By the 1870s, we're going to see our first electric generator being developed, which is going to generate electricity, which can then be wired into people's homes or places of business, uh, producing electric power. Uh, by 1910, we're going to see the first hydroelectric power station using the movement of water, water and hydroelectric uh, turbines to generate power. And these power stations and generators are going to pop up all over the place as a source for power so that we can now wire our buildings and our factories for electricity. So by the end of the 1800s, we're seeing a mass movement away from coal and steam power to electric power. And with that, we're going to have probably one of the most significant inventions, believe it or not. It seems kind of insignificant these days, the light bulb. Uh, but the light bulb is going to be a very transformative invention. And there's actually, you know, a lot of people that were involved with the development of the incandescent light bulb. Um, Thomas Edison in, of course, the United States, who we're all kind of familiar with. But actually, a few months before Edison, 
uh, perfected his bulb. It was actually developed by a guy in England named Joseph Swan. So both these guys are uh, light bulb uh, developers and inventors. Of course, Edison kind of outshines Swan eventually. Uh, through some shady means, but we're not going to go into Edison here in this video lesson. So we've got the light bulb, and we're not going to do a whole deep dive, but just think about how the light bulb is going to change things. Uh, factories can now operate with electric lights, which means they can open and stay open all night. So one of the few reasons factories closed was because it was difficult to see. Using gas lanterns was very dangerous, uh, but now with the incandescent light bulb, we can operate 24 hours a day. That's going to allow businesses to continue production throughout the evening. Factories will be open 24 hours a day, which means an increased demand for workers. Uh, more products are being developed. Uh, it's really, really amazing. Also, just simply being able to go out at night. So we are, uh, and we have street lights. Again, we had those with like gas and kerosene and things like that, uh, which are not in, were not very effective, uh, which were very dangerous. But electricity uh, begins to solve all of those problems. So now businesses can stay open. People can uh, go out and have some sort of nightlife going on. So that's going to transform communities and cities and businesses as well. So electricity becomes so 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 important and the source of power for pretty much everything. And because of that, and as homes are being wired for electricity, more and more consumer goods and products are being developed so that people can purchase them and use them in their homes and use electricity as the power source. So things like washing machines and electric toasters and irons and fans and heaters and vacuum cleaners. All of these products are being developed, marketed and sold to people to purchase for the use in their homes. So as homes are built with electricity, we now have more and more opportunities to sell people more and more goods, which will make doing their chores easier and faster, uh, keep your uh, food cold in the refrigerator, uh, have hot coffee in your little percolator down there in the bottom right, uh, iron your clothes with an electric iron, um, have lamps in your home for light instead of candles. So all of these products are going to explode, which again creates new and new businesses, creates millions of jobs, and continues this industrial revolution moving forward. Some other things that are also happening in terms of uh, advancements in technology is communication. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell comes up with the telephone, providing instantaneous communication over long distances. Again, so imagine how this is going to impact not just the daily lives of individuals, but also business, right? I can pick up my phone, I can place an order, uh, I can communicate quickly with other parts of my business, either within one building or across multiple buildings. Being able to do this is going to be revolutionary, okay? So previously we had, you know, Morse code and we had telegrams and telegraphs, but that was a slow process for the most part. Now I can install a telephone in my house or in my business and I'm able to communicate with people instantaneously. Pretty amazing and awesome. Along with that comes another advancement in communication, which is wireless telegraphy. So I mentioned previously, you know, having to go to a telegram office like Western Union to send a telegram, which has to be sent by a telegram operator uh, and across wires to another business and has to be recorded. And then, then you can go and pick it up and read it. Uh, now we're going to be able to do that wirelessly. So we're going to have wireless communication happening. This allows us to communicate over distances without the need for wires. So we have radio communication. Uh, we're able to share news and information. We're able to communicate uh, from place to place. Uh, this is an absolute game changer uh, in 1897 through uh, Guglielmo Marconi. So again, communication is advancing with the telephone and the radio. So telephone and wireless telegraphy increase people's and businesses' ability to communicate faster and farther. New businesses are going to be created to provide people with access to these inventions. So we're going to have the whole telephone industry and radio industry. Uh, we have millions of jobs being created by both of these inventions. And not only are we able to communicate faster and better, we're going to be able to transport people faster and better. So as our cities develop, we need to be able to move people around those cities. And two big inventions uh, are going to be the streetcars and the subways. 
Uh, street cars ran above ground for the most part. They're on a simple track. They have a electric wire running up uh, to power those street cars. And you can jump on the street car and maybe pay a nickel or two and get yourself from point A to point B. So this is going to allow cities to grow out a little bit wider. It's going to allow people to travel into the cities a little bit easier and to move around those cities a lot faster. Also subways, okay? We are also gonna have subway stations uh, both above ground and uh, underground. Uh, Chicago has the L train, which is uh, running above the ground. We've got uh, in New York City, uh, the subway system, which is developed underneath the ground. Uh, these are ways that large cities can move lots of people quickly and efficiently, and it's gonna really transform how those cities develop. So we've got transportation happening. And then by the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s, we see the automobile developing as well. Going back to some of the earlier models here in 1879 uh, up to 1900. So the automobile slowly but surely is going to emerge as a mode of transportation. And by the 1920s, uh, it's really going to take off and be something that pretty much almost every family has. So public transportation as well as automobiles are gonna allow cities to expand. People who can afford to pay for the transportation can therefore afford to move outside of the city. So our middle-class workers who make good wages have the money to pay for transportation so they can move a couple of miles away from the factory or the business where they work. And we're gonna see entire neighborhoods develop outside of the city in these suburban areas. And of course, with any invention and technology, we're gonna see new businesses and new jobs created to meet the demand of these new products. And what's been happening and what is gonna to continue to happen is this mass production of goods. As we develop better machines, as we develop faster machines, we are gonna be able to produce materials and goods faster and cheaper. We're gonna see a movement to interchangeable parts, an assembly line production where Products are assembled by workers along a moving assembly line, which is gonna increase the speed of production. It's gonna further reduce our costs, and we are gonna be able to continue to produce goods on a much faster and much larger basis. So the idea of mass production becomes much more efficient and effective as we enter the second phase of the Industrial Revolution. And as uh, countries become much more industrialized, we're gonna develop a global marketplace. Now that we have steam liners and boats that are larger and more powerful, we can uh, transport goods across the oceans to other countries faster and more efficient. So we have steam liners that are um, moving throughout the world, carrying uh, supplies and materials, carrying finished goods to other places for sale picking up raw materials and bringing them back home, uh, shipping manufactured goods overseas to sell in new markets, and industrialized nations are going to uh, dominate this world market that's quickly developing, okay? Industrialized nations are gonna invest money in other countries in order to stabilize them and access the materials and markets. In our next unit of study, we're gonna talk about imperialism, which is gonna build onto that idea of this global marketplace where industrialized countries are going out and seizing and taking control of resources and markets. So things are happening very, very, very quickly. Industrialized nations are gonna dominate the global marketplace. Countries that did not industrialize are gonna be at a huge disadvantage. Uh, again, something we'll talk about much more in our next unit of study. And for all the wonderful advances in technology, a lot of terrible things are gonna be happening to people in the name of progress. So when we study imperialism next, we're gonna see some of that happening. We also already know that working conditions and living conditions are pretty terrible. Uh, they will be getting a little bit better, but industrialization does kind of have its dark side. So some key takeaways from this lesson about our second phase of the Industrial Revolution. Some things that you might want to know and remember. The Bessemer process is going to make steel cheaper and much more affordable. And everything switches to steel, allowing cities to grow not only outward now, but also upward. The beginning of the skyscrapers. 
Electricity will begin to replace steam as a power source for factory cities and homes. Communication becomes almost instantaneous with the development of the telephone and the radio. Electricity creates opportunities for new products to be made and sold to consumers, products that they can use inside of their house. New types of transportation will allow cities to expand outward, making travel easier and much more manageable. The mass production of goods is taking place because we're developing more efficient uh, and powerful machines. And by using interchangeable parts and the assembly line, we're able to produce those goods faster and cheaper. And the world is becoming a global marketplace with those industrialized nations dominating non-industrialized nations. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson and I hope you learned something.